better. Welcome back, clinical problem solvers, to another VMR edition with RLR and Masa. We are uh, very excited for today. Masa, why don't you unmute yourself, say a few words, and yeah, let us know how you're doing. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Masa. I'm from Dubai, currently in Ohio doing an elective. Um, you know, getting ready for a match and whatnot. Um, but yeah, this is the second time I present. I'm really excited. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for being here. We are very excited to uh, discuss your case. Um, who's doing teaching points today? If you're doing teaching points, unmute yourself and say a few words. Hey everyone, I'm doing teaching point today. I'm Ethan. Ethan, where are you where are you connecting I'm, from? I'm from Taiwan. What time is it there? Um it's 12 a.m. It's in the midnight. Oh my so, gosh. You deserve <laughs> a reward, my friend. Here it's uh 9 a.m. and I'm barely awake. Where are you <laughs> coming from? Oh, I'm I'm coming to you from Laguna Beach. Let me show you my view, Ethan. Oh, like wow, that's a beach. <laughs> yeah, looks <laughs> good. Thank, thank you for joining us today. And um, tell me one thing, Ethan. What do you like to do outside of medicine? I like to run and playing a kind of chess. It's called Go. I don't know if some people know it. It's called a black and white chess, but nineteen to nineteen. Yeah. Go. Really did fun. you watch? Did you watch the movie Alpha Go? It was very good movie about um, how they took the world champion Go player and and um, had a competition with AI and machine, and the the machine ended up winning. But it's a uh, it's more popular than chess. I learned from that documentary. Very cool. I'll check it out later. Yeah, yeah, check it out. Alpha Go. And then who is scribing today? Uh, I'll be scribing. Oh, is it? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm So Sun. I'm from Jordan. And uh, I recently graduated from medical school and, I'm start and I started my internship. So Sun, what time is it there? Uh, it's 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Okay. You don't deserve any reward like Ethan does because <laughs> it's midnight over there, but that's okay. Th thank you. And So Sun, what do you like to do outside of the um, hospital? Um, I like to bake. And I enjoy watching sitcoms. What's your favorite sitcom? Uh, Modern Family. Oh, I love Modern Family. That's, that's a really good one. Um, okay. Now to hear from the guest of the hour, Ravi Jaha. How are you today? Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> I'm calling from way up north. Um, my favorite um, hobby is to hang out with Prof Rez on our own. <laughs> Um, and Prof Rez, you did really good facilitating the intro session today. I, and I, in the future, I will judge the quality of your intro session by how much of my bowl I can finish. <laughs> and today was amazing. I really, really enjoyed well <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And we're going to pass the mic to Masa and Robbie. Get, get those calories in because you're discussing the first hour clock, my friend. Okay. Um. All right, so I have a 57-year-old female that presented to the emergency department with sudden exacerbation of central chest pain. The, for her HPI, the pain started five days prior to presentation after her son passed away. She described the pain as a squeezing pain, which was intermittent and tolerable before it exacerbated. It was not rela related to any strenuous physical activity. The pain radiated to the left arm, the neck, the jaw, and left shoulder, and was associated with dizziness, nausea, and profuse sweating. Um, one month prior, she was admitted to the hospital for severe hyponatremia and hypokalemia, which were due to indepamide, which is a thiazide-like diuretic. And she also had experienced non-specific chest pain at that time. On her review of systems, she had shortness of breath, nausea, and dizziness, 
with no headache, no weakness, and no urinary symptoms. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Oh, my God, Masa. Every single time you present, you set up with such a rich uh, history of present illness. And I, I just want to call attention to how um, you are setting this up that the patient presents with sudden chest pain. But then you are showing us how important it is to not fall into the trap that sudden means truly sudden. And I think that when we say sudden, there's often an assumption that the patient was previously normal and went from normal to 100 uh, suddenly. But I think in your dissection of the sequence of events, which Prof. Rez teaches us about all the time, I think you're seeing that that narrative is not accurate and that there is a curve with a sharp inflection point towards sudden. And um, maybe I can ask Prof. Rez to reflect on what's, what specific diagnoses he start, uh, starting to cross his mind. And I'll just tackle the reality that um, chest pain, just like back pain and just like headache in most people, is driven, uh, really, the evaluation is driven by uh, red flag features. We talk a lot about red flag features in patients with headaches and back pain, but I think it's probably important to articulate that that same approach is taken by most people who are taking care of patients with chest pain. That's because there is a mantra that applies for all these chief concerns. And that mantra is twofold. There are some very serious life-threatening conditions that live under the realm of headache, back pain, and chest pain. But the most common causes by far and away are not those life-threatening causes. So a set of questions and tools, essentially termed red flags, allows us to distinguish who are we worried about? Who are we not worried about? And that profoundly influences the extent of the evaluation necessary. And so I think it's very helpful to develop a set of tools to say, in this person with this concern, I'm going to worry about what's going on. And I think said simply, the presence of chest pain really just means there's something in the thorax that hurts. And whenever somebody has associated shortness of breath, that fundamentally means that with very few exceptions, the thorax is not just hurting, it's no longer working. And the lack of it working should make you very, very concerned. So patients with zoster, patients with GERD, patients with uh, chest wall trauma, muscle strains should not have failure of the thorax, i.e. shortness of breath. That is one red flag here. However, the shortness of breath is a subjective report that has variable meaning. And if the patient were in front of you tachypnic or hypoxic, that would be much more valid. But there is something here that is even more alarming than the shortness of breath. And it's not where the pain radiates. It's not dizziness, which again is a subjective concern. It's the profound diaphoresis. It is very, very abnormal for patients to be able to, for people to be able to sweat at rest. And what that fundamentally means if you're sweating at rest is that you have absent a hot ambient env environment, a massive increase in your autonomic nervous system. It just so happens that sweating is the only place in the nervous system where both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system act not opposing each other, but act in synergy. And the way that happens is the sympathetic system is the nervous system that perfuses or supplies the sweat glands, but the sweat glands have a muscarinic, i.e. a parasympathetic receptor. So both an increase in sympathetic and parasympathetic tone increase uh, uh, diaphoretic potential. And so some of the benign conditions that we associate with increased diaphoresis are a vasovagal syncope, where a patient has increased parasympathetic tone. But in most patients who have spontaneous diaphoresis at rest, they are having a rapid increase in their sympathetic tone. That is essentially the patient's body telling her there is something really bad happening inside her body. 
that may me that may be that there's something inherently wrong with the signaling mechanisms inside her body, i.e., a panic attack. But it often means in most people that there's something really, really, really bad happening in that moment. And so I think in patients with chest pain who have shortness of breath, you worry a lot because that is thoracic failure. But shortness of breath is subjective enough that seeing sweat pouring out of somebody as they report chest pain should really make your sympathetic tone skyrocket just as much as the patient's. So all I will say is this story is very concerning, and it's very concerning for those reasons. Um, and I'll pass the mic to Prof. S to articulate more on that and what, what's crossing your mind. Good, sir. Two comments. One is I think something you do so well, Robbie, is teach us beyond what's in the textbooks, meaning that like I've never heard anyone talk about diaphoresis like that. And now like going forward, it's going to carry such heavy weight uh, in my analysis, because you're right, like I've taken care of so many people with chest pain and shortness of breath, but I'm like a minority of them are diaphoretic. It's almost like if I can use the analogy of Rigers, like when you see Rigers, you should be worried. So I just really love that. The thing I was laughing at though is you're like, after giving us pure poetry for 10 minutes, you're like, but all I'll say is you should be concerned about this patient. <laughs> Um, I, I have zero to add. Like, I'm going to let that discussion just stand on its own, really. It's just really, an, I mean, we'll use like the sequence of events as things unfold. But um, but yeah, I would love to get more data from us and then we'll add some elements of that HPI. But I, I love that point about the diaphoresis. Okay, for her past medical history, she is obese. She has hypertension, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia and osteoarthritis. Her drug history, she's on metformin, insulin, liraglutide, amlodipine, indepamide, atorvastatin, and empagliflozin. Her social history, she lives with her son and her grandchildren, and she's pretty active around the house. She's a non-smoker and does not drink alcohol. Her family history is unknown and she has no known allergies. On physical examination, upon presentation, she was afebrile with a temperature of 36.4. Her heart rate was 102. Respirate was 20. Blood pressure was 153 over 81. And her SpO2 was 98% on room air. On general exam, she was alert and oriented, but she seemed like she's in discomfort. Her cardiovascular exam, she had normal S1 and S2 with regular rhythm. Her JVP was not raised and she had no lower limb edema. On pulmonary exam, she had bilateral fine and coarse basal crepitations and her abdomen was soft, non-tender with normal bowel sounds. Her neuro and extremities exam was unremarkable. That's it for now. Thank you so much, Masa. And maybe what I'll do is I'll tackle all the data except for the vital signs so that Robbie can continue along his, his train of thinking. And, and I'll say this, you know, when we all heard this story, this poor lady had a catastrophic event occur in her life five days before the onset of, of pain. Now, there's really a, a handful of possibilities of what can be going on here regarding that catastrophic event of losing a child, uh, which I hope no one ever has to go through that experience. One is, is the loss of the child directly related to her current presentation? In a way you can frame it uh, to support that possible hypothesis is that the stress, the stress of losing someone is just causing damage to her heart and potentially leading to a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And I'm gonna quickly then, now that I'm thinking of a possible diagnosis, I'm gonna look at the rest of the data to see what supports and what argues against it. 
on her physical exam, like crackles suge suggest that there's either water, pus, or some other substance in the alveoli, but she's not really giving us a, a story of infection. So I'm going to suspect that that's fluid that's in her lungs. Then I quickly look at the JDP to see if it's because of a cardiac etiology, because if it's stress-induced cardiomyopathy leading to fluid in the lungs, then we should have jugular venous distension. But then I'm reminded that our physical exam isn't perfect. The lack of edema in the lower extremities doesn't dissuade me at all because a third of people with heart failure don't have edema. And especially if it's sudden onset heart failure, I bet you they probably are even less likely to have edema in the lower extremities. The other possibility is that this event actually has zero to do with her current presentation. So when I go down that train of thinking, I look at the past medical history and I'm seeing this lady has metabolic syndrome. She has obesity, she has hypertension, she has type two diabetes. So she has many risk factors for coronary artery disease. And is it possible that she is having an acute coronary syndrome um, and now is presenting to our hospital? The answer is absolutely it's possible. And we know what dictates the complications of acute coronary syndrome, like um, a valve rupturing, like uh, the myocardium rupturing, it's time to treatment. It's time to treatment. And you can draw the same analogy with the gallbladder. What dictates outcomes in cholecystitis is time to treatment. Throw back to a recent ep episode of RLR. So I would say that you have to consider acute coronary syndrome here, um, given the, the background data. And there's one other thought I had, and this is more of me taking a step back. When you have chest pain and shortness of breath, and you're de dealing with thoracic failure, the question becomes, is the heart the culprit here, or is the lung the culprit? Because any process in the lung can also manifest as chest pain. I, you know, it's a gamble, but I would argue that it's hard to dismiss the heart here. It's hard because of the other findings of radiation to the jaw, radiation down the arm. It's very difficult. It's, and it's easy to see how heart failure can result in pulmonary edema and lung failure. Um, so we're gonna have to follow those, those threads as this story unfolds. And I know many of us use that four plus two plus two mnemonic for chest pain. I use it all the time. But the three causes you never want to miss in sudden onset chest pain is ACS, PE, and dissection. Like those three should always be going through your head. You don't want to miss any of those other causes either, but uh, the three that I think of. So I'll pass the mic to Robbie to comment on the vital signs and how that influences his analysis of this case. And no doubt we didn't even talk about the hypokalemia, hyponatremia. We're tracking that, but we're not going to comment on it just yet because it's not relevant just yet. I love the style of discussion, Prof. It's so good to just navigate your thoughts as they come to you. I, thank you so much for sharing them. I didn't, is it really a third of people with heart failure don't have lower extremity edema? That's a mind-boggling statistic. I don't, I don't think I really appreciate it, it was that much. Um, but I'm right there with you. I'm really on in the heart. And I think um, the question is, what do the vital signs add? And I think that... Um, if you approach them from a perspective of presuming this is sinus tachycardia, which you shouldn't presume given our theories about the heart, make sure it's not AFib with RVR. Um, you ask yourself, like, what's the point of sinus tachycardia? What is it trying to accomplish? And the point of si sinus tachycardia is to try to protect you from impending hypotension or to correct current hypotension. So I think the trauma literature is the best literature to talk about this, where you start to lose volume, you start to become hypotensive. The first thing, uh, that goes up as your heart rate, then your pulse pressure, and then you become hypotensive. And so here you're saying, okay, this person is tachycardic. And so she's trying to protect against current or impending hypotension. And then you look and you see her blood pressure. You're like, huh? Why is she tachycardic? She doesn't need to be tachycardic. Her blood pressure is just fine. And so then you wonder, hey, is her heart rate, i.e. Um, the uh, catecholamines that she has on board to drive that heart rate, are they physiologic? Or are they pathologic? Meaning that the um, uh, amount of catecholamine she has in her body is not here meant to protect her against impending catastrophe, but there as a result of, uh, they're, they're, they're in excess. 
the markers on exam of excessive catecholamine are dilated pupils, tremors, and diaphoresis, and she doesn't have those. But if we had synthesized her HPI when she was diaphoretic with this exam, you'd be like, she has too much catecholamines on board. And we see this all the time. We see this all the time when patients come in with intoxication from sympathomimetics like cocaine or withdrawal from sedatives like alcohol. And I saw uh, a couple of patients with this symptom complex all the time. We don't tend to pay too much attention to it because it makes sense in that moment. We're expecting those things to line up. But when we don't see substance use in the history, we start to wonder, oh, is there excessive sympathetic tone not from, from an exogenous materials on or off, but something happening inside the body. And the most common cause of sympathetic excess inside the body is something all of us have felt, pain. What happens when you're in pain? Your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure goes up. The other big thing that happens to patients when they're in healthcare settings because they don't want to be there is panic attack. And so here you're wondering, is the patient in pain? Not really. Does the patient have panic attack or anxiety history? Not really. So what else would cause such a dramatic increase in sympathetic tone? And I think that is worthy of investigating further and further and further. Um, it turns out um, that when you think it through, it, a lot of people have a dramatic increase in their sympathetic tone when an abrupt event happens to them. So this is why in patients with acute coronary syndrome, you might find them to be hypertensive and tachycardic or patients with flash pulmonary edema or uh, patients with aortic dissection or patients who really have anything that happens suddenly to them, um, they get tachycardic and hypertensive. And so I think um, what I'm really doing with this increase in sympathetic tone is I know it's a hypothesis. I don't have or catecholamine levels in front of me to say they're too much, but it's a hypothesis. Where does that hypothesis take me? Initially, it takes me to exogenous substances. And when that's not at play, I then go to our sudden onset schema. I'd be like, did something suddenly happen to this person somewhere? Did she suddenly have a pulmonary embolism, suddenly dissected aorta, suddenly had acute coronary syndrome? And you see that in the realm of chest pain, it doesn't allow you to make much progress because all the things that we worry about, pneumothorax, esophageal rupture, all of them are sudden onset. So it just makes me really believe that maybe she had something smoldering and that she truly has a sudden onset physiology right in front of us right now. Um, so like we did in the first aliquot, we took a long time to tell you that this HPI would have initially led me to think that this is something that's been building up and that this was pseudo sudden, that it actually wasn't sudden, that it just... Um, was the continuation. It's like when patients with aortic stenosis present with syncope, you know, the problem has been going on for a long time. But I'm recalibrating that in light of these vital signs. And I'm worried that actually this was a rapid takeoff and her body is feeling it and her catecholamines are really high. Uh, and, and I'm more worried than I was beforehand. But practically speaking, I'm right there with Prof Rez this is screaming the heart. And whenever something's screaming the heart, you know the EKG is going to be very, very helpful. Either it's going to tell you the answer with elevations or recip and reciprocal decretions, or it's going to give you a tremendous amount of guidance about where to go. So I'm really, really looking forward to seeing that piece of data. I think it would help a lot in real life. Okay, I'll move on to the labs. Um, her hemoglobin is 12.3. White blood cells, 7.3, CRP, 50.2. Her sodium is 135, potassium, 4.1. Point of care glucose was 13.3, which is high. Her PT is 10.6. P or her, her PT is 10.6. Her PTT is 22.9. Her LDL was 1.35. Troponin was 171, which was very high in our lab. LDH was 201, which was normal. 
and HbA1c was 7.2, her CKMB was 72, which is mildly elevated. Um, I have her EKG, chest x-ray, and echo. Do you want them now? Yeah. I think it, it, just to follow what might happen in real life, I think the echo probably might be a little delayed, at least in my life. So uh, but in my life, it'd probably be delayed by a long, long, long time. Um, but maybe you can give us the EKG. I think that would be really helpful. Okay. So on EKG, um, her EKG was the same as her previous EKGs, which showed a normal sinus rhythm, Q waves in leads 3, AVF, and V3 poor R wave progression with no new ST or T wave changes. That's it. Um, very, very interesting. You know, I, I Prof has been on the heart train and so I'll leave the EKG and the trope for him to analyze. I think it was really important to, to understand um, and to pay attention to the labs because it's very, very easy in almost any concern to be so concerned about what the patient is talking about and to forget to analyze it in the context of the bigger picture. And I think yesterday's VMR was a great example. We had a patient with a, with a neck mass um, who had a fever. And I think it was ultimately the combination of the local features, the neck mass and the systemic signature of fever um, that was key to synthesizing it together and coming to the final diagnosis, which I won't spoil for anybody. And so here, I think if we analyze the systemic signature, the systemic signature is very, very minimal compared to the heaviness of the chest. The kidney function is normal. The CBC is normal. For example, just to point out a rare possibility, but you always want to keep in your mind, if the platelet count were 25 and the hemoglobin were low and the patient had hemolysis, you'd be thinking, oh my gosh, this is a patient with a MAHA who's having uh, acute catastrophe. So you always want to be open to that and not get blinded in. So I'll just say that I'm really glad that the labs now allow us to focus in on not just a chest pain syndrome, but an isolated chest pain syndrome. And I'll, and I'll pass the mic to Prof Rez to analyze the rest of the data. You know, Robbie, something you mentioned in the earlier um, aliquot in which you discussed was that like you're really concerned with catecholamine surge given the tachycardia and the hypertension. And so I was just looking at this patient's glucose. You may be wondering like someone who has this degree of chest pain, I bet you she hasn't been eating normally. Like when we're in discomfort and in pain, so how does she have hyperglycemia? She probably has counter-regulatory hormones. So now I think I'm, I'm adding additional, you know, support to, to your earlier hypothesis. And I think this troponin is very uh, concerning here. It's concerning because it tells us one truth. And what truth is that? Is that there's myocardial cell necrosis. There's no other place that troponin comes from. Back in the day, uh, decades ago, trope came from other tissues, but the tropes that we use these days always reflect myocardial cell necrosis. And so now our job is to determine what's causing the myocardial cell necrosis. And this brings us to the troponin pyramid, which at that base of that pyramid is ischemia. So there's two ways a cell dies. Either it's not getting blood supply or the demand that it requires is too much for the blood that's being supplied. And in that base is acute coronary syndrome, but don't forget there are other conditions like Minoka, where you have myocardial infarction without obvious obstruction on the catheter. And that's very relevant to women with metabolic syndrome. The less common etiologies at the base of that pyramid are dissection and thrombus and embolus. In the middle of the pyramid, this is where the demand issue becomes at play. And Robbie mentioned hypertension, aortic stenosis, PE, anything that can cause demand. But this is where you gotta be really careful. We have tachycardia here, we have hypertension here. Is that causing demand? Don't, I would say that's like a diagnosis of exclusion. Don't lead with that. And then we have the peak of the pyramid. And I don't think it's worth talking about the peak of the pyramid until we have the next troponin level. Why? Because it, it, it tells us and teaches us that troponin kinetics plays a huge role in us navigating up this beautiful pyramid because the two base layers of that pyramid, the troponin goes like this. 
up and down, up and down. At, and that's even without intervention many times, up and down, up and down. But at that peak of the pyramid, the troponin flatlines. It stays elevated. It's not getting cleared. So I'd be very interested in the next troponin level. The CKMB is just, it's coming from the heart. It's not coming from the muscle. CKMB can come from the heart. So the focus is the myocardial cell. We've ruled out STEMI based on that EKG. Uh, and STEMI and all those causes I mentioned are still at play. That next troponin will let us know if we should be running towards the top of the pyramid. But at baseline and base rate, you got to rule out plaque rupture. You got to rule out uh, an obvious like demand ischemia. Robbie, anything else to comment on before we get some additional data? Not on my friend. Absolutely superb. I completely agree. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't have another troponin. <laughs> Oh my but, gosh, don't worry, but maybe don't don't apologize at all, Masa. And maybe I'll make this argument and just let Robbie talk about this for a second because I think it's such an important point. Robbie, like this patient has been having chest pain for five days. And I think we can argue that that troponin has been elevated because if she's coming in now after the onset of pain, I would imagine, you know, that there's, I would just, maybe you can just comment on that peak of that pyramid and like how, when you activate that, that script. Yeah, Prof. Raz is really making a, such an important point about the fact that um, a dynamic troponin elevation often localizes us to the vasculature. And so if there's something inherently wrong with the heart killing it, then the troponin will be elevated, but will just constantly be elevated. You know, um, a dynamic troponin elevation is basically that there is a problem in the vessels that comes and goes. And so if it is go continuing to, uh, to evolve, it's unlikely to be intrinsically in the heart. And um, I think that, uh, I actually didn't realize this, Prof. Rassel, I don't have anything in, in real time. You're right. Like if the patient has been having this symptom complex for five days, I think the, the pretest probability of a more static syndrome uh, is, more, is more probable. And so simply by like, wow, this is such a great observation. But, you know, honestly, Prof. Rassel, I'm just realizing it now. And I'd love for you to, since you thought of it, I'd probably have fleshed it out. Take the mic away from me. I think it's a beautiful observation. Thank you. And, and I hope it, it actually pans out. Um, and I think that like, it's making me activate the myocarditis, the infiltrative disorders and the stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And because that was one of our earlier hypotheses, I think we go into the echo looking for features of stress-induced cardiomyopathy. If those features are not there, then maybe stepping back and asking the question, could there be myocarditis? But the truth is with myocarditis, usually there's like an inflammatory signature. There's like a fever. There's something that's suggesting inflammation and chest pain. The infiltrative disorders, it just, to, for me, it's not on that sort of um, level. So I, um, by the way, everyone, I know this like I'm at a restaurant. It's, it's, it seems like I'm living this life of privilege right now. Someone's like pouring me coffee as I'm discussing medicine. <laughs> I'm very grateful for this moment, but, but this is not prof res at baseline. This is, far, this is, this is prof res at the peak of the pyramid where it's a very narrow part of his life. Anyways, Mike, to you, Masa. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're funny. Okay. Um, <laughs> Her chest x-ray was normal. Um, her CT angio with contrast was normal. On echo, um, it showed normal left ventricular dimensions with mild impairment of systolic function. No, I'll take that back. Okay. It showed akinetic mid and apical septum and apical inferior wall with the apical anterior uh, uh, wall echinacea. Yeah, so stress-induced, stress uh, yeah, these are st her stress-induced wall motion abnormalities. Um, and so then she was admitted to the CCU for coronary angio, and then coronary angio would reveal the diagnosis. Martha, that's so helpful. And I would love to hear from Robbie, um, if I can ask you a specific question. So I think we all, not all, but many of us are concerned, could this be stress-induced cardiomyopathy? Um, I was just curious from your perspective, if there's, if there's any pearls you can teach us 
about this condition in terms of arriving to the diagnosis or anything else that like through your hours of study that you can uh, share with us? No, Prof. Raz, you called it for a long time ago. And I think the echocardiographic features of this condition um, are so uh, powerful that they really bring it to light. And so, for example, to talk about more um, fundamental principles about sensitivity and specificity, the echocardiographic findings of, uh, of stress-induced cardiomyopathy are incredibly sensitive. Now, there's a couple variants of them. The apical variant is the most commonly described but it's almost impossible to diagnose stress-induced ca cardiomyopathy without one of those patterns, usually the apical variant, which we're seeing here. That is sensitive. Now, the question is, is it specific? And the answer is no. And the other condition that can mimic this, this, uh, of this particular apical pattern is an LED infarct. It can look very, very similar to this, which is why you think about stress-induced cardiomyopathy, often informed by the story, but you really, really, really think about it when you see the echo. That's a sensitive test. Now, what many uh, cases describe is the mistake of assuming that the sensitive finding is a specific finding. It's not. And that's why, ultimately, you need to synthesize the echocardiography with, a, um, a, a, with an angiogram that does not show an LED infarct. Um, you, uh, Prof. Rez mentioned early on the idea of Minoka with having an, a coronary event, but the angio being disappointing or not revealing. And so there's always a little bit of a tension. Does the patient have an LED infarct mimicking Takatsubo's in a way that's super tough because the patient really uh, um, had a, uh, uh, a coronary event that was not appreciable on uh, cath? So the ultimate true differential diagnosis of Takotsubos is a Minoka in the territory of the LAD. And in some instances, very astute cardiologists will recognize some unusual features of the story, some unusual features of the echo, and get the ultimate test, which is an MRI that can distinguish between uh, uh, tissue that was infarcted or, ta or Takotsubos. So um, echo is sensitive. You need the cath to make it specific, but the cath is not perfect. And the MRI can plug the hole in the cath that Minoka uh, introduces. And so that's, I think, yeah, that's where I think we'd be at with this, uh, with this process. Well, how are you thinking oh, about it? Oh my gosh, I, I love that so much because now I'm like thinking about the EKG that Masa presented and there was poor r -way progressions in the anterior leads, which is usually indicative of LAD disease. And so I'm wondering, like you have someone with metabolic syndrome, possibly LAD disease, possibly, it's not specific, but that's the pattern on the EKG, who had a stressful event. And remember, a stressful event will predispose you both to ACS and to stress-induced cardiomyopathy. It's almost like how sepsis can cause demand ischemia, but also increases the risk for ACS. And they've shown that during the flu um, periods in, in an Asian article. So I, you know, I knew you were going to deliver a pearl and that's such a great pearl. Like Robbie, for me, either scenario, stress-induced cardiomyopathy or an LAD lesion is quite practical. Is there one that you're favoring here over the other or you're open to both outcomes? Yeah, Prof. I definitely open to both. I think that, um, I think that when there is no... When there is no reason to be attached to a hypothesis because you have a pathway, I think I, in my now, now that I'm an old man who has acai bowls, in my younger years, I used to be more attached to cooler diagnoses. And as soon as I would think about them, I would have a much harder time of letting them go because they're inherently cool. But I think, um, uh, but I think now more so, you just want to know what's happening. And I think that I'm trying to shed the previous allure of like wanting this to be Takatsubos because it's cool and rare. And um, and so I don't want it to be anything but the, the truth. And in a hundred patients with this kind of presentation, there would be an appreciable number of both conditions, I think. I'd like the, I don't think this would be 99% Takatsubo, 1% LED or 1% Takatsubo, 99% LED. So... Um, I'm I'm open to both. 
Uh, are you are you taking more gambles than I am today? No, no, never. I'm just saying that you're firing on all six cylinders. <laughs> Go listen We've to yet to establish, RLR. folks. We uh, yeah, you got to listen to RLR to understand that. But we we have yet to establish how many cylinders there are. So if you do know, please enlighten, enlighten us. Okay, so um, on coronary angio, um, it showed normal coronary angiography with no coronary arterial plaques and apical left ventricular ballooning. And so she was diagnosed with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and she was started on heart failure therapy. That's Masa, it. this was so educational. I, oh, please take the mic, tell, uh, share with us how, what you learned, what this experience was like. Um, excited to hear about it. Um, well, you know, we always see chest pain in the ER. And so in the back of our head, it's always ACS. But this was like very, um, I mean, I think this is like my first time um, facing chest pain that like kind of directed us towards like a rare condition. And so this was uh, very interesting and um patient was so cute I had such a connection with her and so I really like this case and um I know it's like just chest pain but I think like um it's very important to um touch on the, these like more straightforward straightforward cases especially for like the early learners like me um and yeah I know we all like they're really interested in complicated complicated ones but these are like really important to um yeah for like um to progress and like hopefully reach you guys's level um and you guys had such a comprehensive uh discussion that I mean um made me look at this case in a different view as you always do which is amazing so thank you very much for um yeah thank you for your time and thank you for discussing this case with me pleasure is all ours i i would say that um i would say that we're all probably now um have to mitigate a little bit of our vmr bias because i masa you might be under the impression that presenting a chest pain case that results in a very rare diagnosis of takatsubos is not rare enough for vmr i would say this is pretty rare um, really <laughs> yeah i i the last time i saw a case of takatsubos was seven years ago in real life and so okay. yeah so it's here that it's not rare, it's just on your vmr <laughs> yeah no this is this is awesome uh, and i think you know it really allows us to talk about some really important fundamental concepts, which has been, uh, which is honestly the uh, most important thing. So thank you so much for bringing this. I hope, I hope sincerely that the next case you bring is a patient with an MI. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I think we don't get to talk about MI and, and pneumonia and urinary tract infections enough. The poor folks in the CP Solvers Academy have to listen to those kinds of cases all the time. Um, uh, but I hope you bring more and more of those. I really do. Prof, has any final reflections before we hand the mic to Ethan? No, I just wanted to uh, just echo what Robbie said. And Masa, thank you so much. Like I always learn so much from these cases. Like the main learning point for me today was the value of diaphoresis and like how much we should take that um, seriously and how much progress we can make in terms of uh, knowing an, uh, an acute condition is happening. So thank you for bringing this case, Masa. It was perfectly presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for listening. I appreciate all the comments. Thank you. All right, Ethan. You're, uh, you de definitely weren't playing Go because uh, you were crushing the teaching points watching you do them in real time. I'll hand the mic to you to um, to take us through them. Thank you, Masa, for this great case and Rabi and Reza for the amazing discussion. So today we have a 57-year-old female presenting with chest pain and with a, a disease nature of a pseudo sudden nature. And here in the presentation of chest pain, we have to men mention the red flags of chest pain because of the possible um, alarming um, more dangerous etiologies. 
And in this case, shortness of breath is one of the logging features because it means thorax is not only hurting, but also not working well. And also profound diaphoresis is another red flag because it means increase in autonomic systems. And in sweat glands, sympathetic and parasympathetic tones work synergi synergically. And in, the, in, in here in chest pain, it means increase in sympathetic tones. And with the a um, recent catastrophic event of the patient, uh, the, con the possible connection is a Takotsubu cardiomyopathy. And also because the patient also had the risk factors of coronary artery disease, we still have to consider ACS, especially um, ACS depends on time to treatment. And the three emerging causes of cardiac chest pain is ACS, P, and aortic dissections. And in the vitals here with tachycardia, but also hypertensives, it, it's a presentation of excessive catecholamine. And in with excessive catecholamine, we have to think about that if it's pathologic or physiologic. And in, in physiologic, it means that the tachycardia is to prevent, is to prevent a possible future hypotensions. And if there's a path, pathologic excessive catecholamine, we have to think about, for example, substance abuse like cocaine, which uh, in physical exam, we don't have seen see the clues of that. And without substance abuse, we have to consider these sources like, um, for example, like common causes like pain or an acute stress event like PE or ACS. So in a patient with chest pain, EKG, ch chest X-ray and troponin I would help us make a lot of progress. And also in this case, from the labs and the imaging, there are scar systemic features and the signatures are all focused in the heart. So we are thinking about the isolated heart syndromes. And with the elevated troponin, how uh, it means myocardial necrosis. And we can um, assess these features um, through the troponin pyramid, thinking about um, it could be due to decreased supplies to the myocardiums or increased demand of the myocardium or others. So we have to train the troponin to differentiate it between the three etiologies. And also, although we don't have a um, trend value of troponin here, but the nature of presentation here suggests a continuation of myocardial injuries. So it would be more, more likely to be the top of the pyramids, like myocardioditis, uh, takotsubo cardiomyopathy, or infiltrative cardiomyopathies. And the patients ultimately diagnosed with epic diagnosed with Takotsubo myocardial cardiomyopathies with the epical hypokinesis and the absence of plague ruptures in the catheters. And Ravi also mentions a very useful pearl, which is that epical hypokinesis in uh, echo is a sensitive but not specific findings of Takotsubo cardiomyopathies because LED obstruction could also do that, present like that. So we have to and also, we also need a card uh, characterizations to uh, exclude the possibilities of LD, OAD rupture, uh, plague ruptures. And also, cardio MRI could also help to differentiate it between the two causes. And Shema mentioned in the chat that uh, the, 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 the findings that could differentiate between the two conditions is a late gadolinium enhancement, which could be seen in MI and myocardia, myocarditis, but not in my Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And that's the teaching point today. Yeah, I'll give them a standing ovation. That was awesome. Not only were you giving us uh, teaching points from our conversation, but also uh, from the website with the schema, but also in uh, from Shema. I only have one piece of advice, uh, Ethan, which is whenever you're writing Shema's name, you should write it all in capitals with five exclamation marks after it. This is the Shema. Um, all right, y'all have a wonderful rest of your day. See y'all next time.